Thank you very much for the organizers uh, for inviting me. Thank you very much to the American Association of Women Economists and thank you to the EHL for having me this morning to give you a brief presentation of the great diversity in Switzerland. So as it has been said, I'm one of the authors of this book, which is more a baby than a book because it, uh, it took us many years to produce and its weight is three kilos and 70 grams. It's just like babies, you give the exact, uh, <laughs> the exact weight of the book. So it's about all the grapes that are cultivated in the world and of course you will find all the grapes that I'm, I will be speaking about today in this book. More specifically, if you're interested in Swiss grapes, I wrote this book in three languages, um, available on Amazon and whatever platform. I will not give you um, information about the parentages of Swiss grapes today because time is too short, but you will find all the information in this book if you're interested over the, the next days. I'm mentioning another, another two books by my colleague Jean-Paul Schwind. He's an economist and also a sociologist, and he wrote very interesting and recent books about Swiss wine, the origins until 2050. Is it working? Yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, this one about uh, more the sociology and, and the globalization of wine business with respect to Swiss wine industry. So I recommend you to check these books. About Switzerland, well, since you're here, you probably know where Switzerland is on the map, which is not always the case, especially in the US, uh, where many times I had to, to mention that Switzerland and Sweden are not, not the same, <laughs> so that's very common. As you might know as well, Switzerland has four official languages, German, well, Swiss German, which, which is a group of, of um, different dialects, uh, French, Italian, and Romance, which is in this area, in Graubünden. It's a mixture of uh, different languages. If you, if you look at the Swiss banknotes, you have the amount, like 10 francs, in all four languages. It's really interesting to, to check. Okay, you know Switzerland for Matterhorn, you know Switzerland for watches, for Swiss knife and chocolate. But many people do not know Switzerland for the wine. And we have a reason for that. This is a, a map of Switzerland that uh, was produced for the World Atlas of Wine by Hugh Johnson and Justice Robinson. I was responsible for the um, Swiss chapter. So this is what we, we produced for the book. And Switzerland is divided in six official wine regions. The most important in terms of area is Valle in this color. Some of you will get there uh, on Friday, uh, or maybe all of you will, get, will, will go there on Friday. Uh, second is Vaux. We are approximately here. Lausanne is here. This is Geneva Lake, Lake Geneva, and Vaux is here. Then you have uh, Ticino, uh, Italian-speaking region. Today they mostly grow Merlot in this area. The German-speaking Switzerland, you have Geneva area and Three Lakes area. So these are the six regions. But as you can see on the map, uh, it, it's quite diverse. And if you, if you travel in these places, the geography and the climates are extremely different from one place to the other, which makes us say very often that Swiss wine does not exist. There is not one idea of Swiss wine, because we have many different climates, many different terroirs, and many different grape varieties, especially. Yet we are a very old wine region. We have evidence of grape cultivation or consumption going back before the Roman era, during the um, Celtic era, this is 800 to 500 BC. They have found grape pips in this area. This is Valle, so Switzerland is here, Valle is here. This is the German-speaking part of Valle. During the construction of the highway, which is a good, good thing uh, from the highway, is that you, you dig up archaeological sites mm -hmm. and you can study them, and then you cover them with the highway. 
<laughs> That's what they are doing. So they found grape pips, uh, which I tried to analyze with the DNA, but uh, the DNA was completely destroyed, unfortunately. But it would be fascinating to know what were cultivated or eaten uh, in this area by them. This is another interesting uh, way to, to learn from the past. This is, again, Valais. This is Sion, by the way, it's where I live. This is a natural lake dating back to the glacier time. So the pollen of all the plants around the lake have been deposited at the bottom of the lake. And you can do what we call palynology. You can do the study of the pollens that were deposited at the bottom. And this is what my colleagues did. You have different, you have Olmos, uh, Pinus, etc. And here you have Vitis, grape. Here almost nothing. And since 8 or 600 BC, you start to have more and more Vitis pollen which makes us think that around the lake they were starting here to cultivate grapes before the Roman era. So we, are, we have a very old uh, history in wine making and wine uh, consumption. This is, uh, these are artifacts of uh, clay vessels called uh, trotola, trotola jars, dating 300-200 BC, that were used to drink wine. Maybe the wine was not Swiss, maybe it was wine from from the Roman, from the today Italy, probably, but they were drinking wine. And during the Roman era, the um, viticulture developed immensely, and we found these pruning, pruning knives between the second and the eighth century AD. So it shows that we were cultivating vines and grape varieties since a long time. So now, what we have, the result of it, is heroic viticulture. I want you to, to realize, and you will, you will see during your wine trips uh, tomorrow and Friday, to realize how steep the Swiss vineyards can be, <coughs> how spectacular they can be. First and foremost, the Lavo vineyard is very close to Lausanne. It's uh, on the uh, east of Lausanne. Very steep vineyards, some of them more than 45 degrees. This has become UNESCO World Heritage Region since 2007. You have Ticino, also about the lake. You have Valle. Okay, we, we don't see very well with the, with the light. But here we have Valle with dry stone walls that are very high and, and allow to grow your vines in terraces. And again, Zurich with the lake. This represents a high cost of labor. High cost of labor, I give you two numbers. The lowest number of hours per hectare per year in Switzerland is in Geneva because it's almost all flat. You can mechanize everything. It's around 400. Bordeaux, in comparison, the average is 300. But if you go to these area, the average is 1,500, and in some, some areas, 2,000 hours per hectare per year to work in these vineyards which means we, will, we should be at least five times more expensive than Bordeaux. <laughs> and, and, and the wages of the workers is higher than in France, so we should be 10 times more expensive than Bordeaux. I wish this would be the case one day. <laughs> but nobody knows us abroad. Why is that? Because we, we are good drinkers. I think we're number five in the world ranking of uh, wine drinkers, Swiss people. Uh, we consume 35% of domestic production. We import 65% of what we drink. And out of the Swiss production, we export approximately 1%, even less than 1% of what we produce. Um, my colleague from Swiss Grapes is helping to increase this number, but it's, it's not growing very, very easily. And also, by the way, when you get this number, the great Bordeaux wines that are imported to Switzerland and then re-exported to Singapore and Taiwan are counted in this 1%. So can you imagine how low is the export of Swiss wines? You're lucky to have some of the best Swiss wines uh, for tasting today. For the uh, import, we mostly import from Italy, France, Spain, Portugal and others. Others are distributed like this. So this makes Switzerland uh, a fantastic platform uh, in order to know 
the wines from different countries. It's like in London, you can find wines from all over the world. In Switzerland, it's almost the same case. The reason is because 65% of, of what we drink is imported. So you're gonna treat the, the numbers, it doesn't matter. This is um, the evolution of wine consumption in Switzerland. What you have here is the uh, total consumption. And as you can see, it dropped by a large amount, 25% since 1994, 25% less. And this is where we are today. And in two years, we lost 8% of consumption, which means that the market is very tight and the market is, has become very difficult for Swiss wines and mostly for imported wines. So it's going down for many different reasons. We can speak about that during the discussion. What I want to speak to you uh, about is the grape varieties. When I did my book in 2017, I took all the official information about grapes that are cultivated in Switzerland and I amounted to 252 grape varieties that are cultivated in Switzerland. Yet Switzerland is a bit less than 15,000 hectares. If you compare, 15,000 hectares is the equivalent of Alsace in France. And in Alsace, they grow 10 grapes. We grow 250 officially, and if you include all the, all the, um, the, the tests and the assays that have been made, you amount to 300 on such a tiny portion of land. We'll speak during the panel discussion about this situation. And also, the AOC, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, the Appellation System, is allowing 168 or officially uh, varieties in the AOC, like Zurich 85. You have all the hybrids, you have all everything you want, it, it's included. Vaux has 66, etc., Valle has 57, and so on. We will also have to speak about this situation. Is it good? Is it realistic? Uh, is it the solution? When I wrote the book, I made three different categories of Swiss grapes. This category of indigenous grapes is a category of, of those that were born in Switzerland. These are traditional, introduced before 1900, and these are allogenous, introduced after 1900. I chose this date because it approximately corresponds to the arrival of phylloxera in Switzerland. So after phylloxera, we know that many things have changed, so they have introduced grapes like Syrah, good idea, Viognier, Nebbiolo, Dunkelfelder, bad idea, etc. Et uh, the traditional ones were introduced during the Middle Ages, for like Savagnin, Muscat, uh, in the 18th, 19th century for Pinot, Gamay, Silvaner, and so on. I have 23 of them. They are historical. They have found a second home in Switzerland. And the indigenous uh, include the hybrids that have been created either by the official uh, um, governmental research center, Agroscope, or by private people. They were created in Switzerland, so I have to include them in the indigenous uh, hybrids of crossing. And I have 21 heritage grape varieties on which I like to focus, and that you will be able to taste um, at least tonight and also the next days. The 21 indigenous or heritage grape varieties that I have identified are Chasselin and all of these. I, I made a separation here because Chasselin is the most planted white grape variety in Switzerland. And with 3,500 3, hectares, it, it, it has a very uh, a big importance on the Swiss wines. But if you look at the other ones, some names you've never seen and you will not taste. Some you will. You will taste Arvin, <coughs> you will taste Cornalin, you will taste um, maybe Rutupé, you will taste Röschling, you will taste Completa. So if you take the surfaces of all of these together, you amount more or less to 800 hectares, which is 5.5% of the country. 
So if we set aside Chasla, which is from the Geneva Lake area, if we set aside this one, the 21, the 20 other ones out of this total area only represent 5.5%. I don't know any other historical wine region that relies only on 5% of indigenous historical grape varieties and that is growing everything else. I think we are unique in the world in that sense and we will discuss the direction that we should take. So since we did not have enough grapes, uh, there was a need for the uh, Swiss growers to solve some problems. In the 60s and 70s, before the Appalachian system, when the yields were not regulated, Pinot wines and Gamay wines were too light in color, uh, or the Chasla was too light in sugar. So they created grape varieties in order to blend them with Chasla and to blend them with Pinot and Gamay to improve the sugar and to improve the color. So they created these two Charmont and Chorin, uh, uh, Doral, sorry, today 10 and 35 hectares. Uh, and they created, I'm going back to this guy later, they created in, for reds these three, Gamaret, Granoir, Marat, Giolinois, Galota, Carminois, all of these had <coughs> the aim of improving the anthocyanins, so the color, and also the botrytis resistance. And some of them have uh, um, uh, important services like Camaret, 430, some of them not like Mara, it's more recent, etc. And more recently, they have created hybrids. So the difference between crossings and hybrids, the, crossing, the crossings occur within the same uh, uh, botanical species. The botanical species is Vitis vinifera. If you take one Vitis vinifera and you cross them deliberately by human hand uh, to, to create another grape, this is a crossing. So for example, you take Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot, you cross them together in 1982, Carminois is a crossing. If you take a Vitis vinifera and you cross it with another Vitis that is not vinifera, that comes from uh, either the Americas or Eurasia, then you have a hybrid. You have a hybrid because you cross two different species. That's what they did, for example, with Divico. I don't know if you're gonna taste it. Divico is a recent hybrid created in 96, but uh, produced only since 2013, which is highly resistant to botrytis and powdery and downy mildews. And its counterpart, its white counterpart is Divona. So both are crossings between Gamare and Brunner, so they are brothers and sisters. And Brunner is a German hybrid itself with many different vitis something in the family tree of this hybrid. So the total of all these hybrids is 928 hectares, which is 6.3% of the service. Not bad, but it's not a revolution either. Because <coughs> if we look at the varieties that are cultivated today in Switzerland, this, these are the, the sources from 2022, mostly you have reds, less white. This was not the case before the 90s. Before the 90s, we used to produce more whites than red, then the market was requesting more red, so people planted more red. So the, 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 um, the turn was in the 90s. We have Pinot Noir, Gamay, Merlot, then these two crossings and others. So as you can see, the three first, the, the, the three most important red grape varieties in Switzerland are French grape varieties. They come from France. Pinot comes from Burgundy, uh, Gamay as well, and Merlot from Bordeaux. So we are the, the, the Swiss wine market is dominated by French grape varieties. Yet we have at least 21 indigenous heritage grape varieties to work with, and we would be the only one in the world to do it. For the wines, we have Chasla, luckily it's ours, and then Mulotuga, which is a crossing, Chardonnay, Sylvaner, and Petit Arvin, which is a heritage autochthonous variety. So as you can see, uh, this is the situation today, and the question will be, do we have to change that slowly, little by little? Another thing that you will realize when you will visit Swiss producers 
is that great names in Switzerland is a versatile concept. For historical reasons, we like to change the names of grape varieties all the time. One small example, Arwen is the official name. Petit Arwen is a nickname, is a synonym. So many people, when you, are, when, when you show them Arwen, they say, oh, you also have Petit Arwen. I would like to try it, it's the same. So then you have Chasla, we call it Fondon in Valais, <coughs> because the berries of Fondon, when you squeeze them between your fingers, are splitting, and in, in French, to split is fondre. So fondant is the one that splits between the fingers. That's why it's called fondant. Marsan, we call it Hermitage because it was brought back from Tal Hermitage in, in Northern Rhone. Miller Choga, we call it Riesling Silvana, although we know that this is not really a crossing between Riesling and Silvana. It's a crossing between Riesling and Madeleine Royale. Uh, <coughs> Pinot Gris, we call it Malvasie because we used to make sweet wines with that and we wanted to to have some of the fame of the historical Malvasia, so we call it Mal Malvasie. Savagnin Blanc from Jura, which is called Traminer in, in Germany, is called Haida or Bayern in Switzerland. <coughs> Silvana is called Johannesburg. This is more complicated. Gornema uh, is called Humain Rouge, Pinot Noir, Blau Burgunder, Klevner, or Savagnin, depending on where you are. And Rouge du Pays is called Gornema. It's very complicated. I'm having a hard time when people visit uh, Switzerland with me to to make them understand this historical situation. Also, uh, we're going to speak, I hope, in the panel discussion about the so-called PVs. PVs, well, my German is not so good, but it, it's the abbreviation for Pilzwiderstandfähige Rebsorten, which are the grape varieties that are resistant to fungal diseases. So we have Divico, that was uh, created a few years ago. This one, well, Cabernet Girard was created by a private breeder called Valentin Blackner, uh, next to the, in, in the Swiss Jura, next to the French Jura. And then Regen, Joanitas, Solaris, and Souvenir are German hybrids. So this is the situation of hybrids. And I will conclude with uh, some remarks, because we're going to talk about the future of Swiss wines. With respect to climate change, we will, we will have to mitigate and adapt to this situation. I will not go into details of climate change and viticulture. It would deserve another uh, conference or even a, a day session about that. But we, we hear very often that grape varieties must match terroir. And I say that this is too simplistic. Reality is much more complicated. What you need to do is to match and to adapt the right clone on the right rootstock on the right terroir. And this makes combinations countless. Rootstock, you know what rootstocks are, of course. Uh, there are hundreds, hundreds of rootstocks that are available, yet in every region, they rely on two or three. Why? Because my father and grandfather did, did the same. So we are, we are not exploring the huge diversity of rootstocks that could help mitigate climate change. This is one huge uh, uh, field of research and work. And also, what I like to emphasize and suggest for, for the future of Swiss wine is to highlight and promote the toponyms. Uh, in French, it's lieu dit, um, places, names. And the example is Bourgogne. We call them climat. Every wine lover know, knows about Von Romane Louis Saint Georges, and then the, the real amateur will go for Les Chaumes, or I would like Les Suchaux by this vigneron, Les Richbourg, La Romane Conti, right here. So this has reached international fame, and my wish for Switzerland is that in a few decades we will achieve that. Not far from here, we have the Laro, a wine region, as I said, UNESCO World Heritage. They have already started to. Uh, emphasize uh, and, and to focus on the village names, Butri Villa names in this area. I did this this, this work uh, a few years ago for a small village in Valais called Vetro. You, you might you might see that on, on your trip. And this is these are all the local names, and many of them have historical mention going back to 800 years, six, seven, or 800 years. 
which is unique in the world, and in my opinion, it is one way of, of being different. Even if they grow a lot of grape varieties, they will be the only ones to have this place or this place or this place. The same goes for Feshi. I also did a work for Feshi, which is in Canton de Vaux, uh, with all these different names in the same appellation that could be emphasized. For example, these are the historical mansion of everything is red is, a, is, is the name of a duty of, of a place. And this is something that we should work on and emphasize more. There's a lot of, of historical work to do all over the wine regions, but I think this is one key uh, to make us unique. So before concluding, I'm asking a few open questions, helping uh, Mr. Rao to continue the, the discussion. For example, does great diversity create identity? My answer is clearly no, but many people don't agree with me, so we can speak about that. Do we need less varieties in AOC system? Again, my answer is yes, and many people disagree. Uh, do we need more hybrids? My answer is also yes, but not for everything and not for everywhere. And do we need to focus on indigenous grapes? Definitely yes. Because all these grapes have gone through different climate changes. Many of them are around since the Middle Ages and before, so they have already gone through a, a warmer climate, colder climate, and they have the plasticity to mitigate climate change. This would deserve a full presentation. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, I like to say, be smart, drink Swiss wines, which is what we're going to do today, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>